Okay. Okay. I am. I'm ready. All right. Are we starting? Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Charlene Stevens. I am the director uh, and founder of Arcade Projects Curatorial. And um, thank you for joining us for the artist talk for California Light. And I first would like to um, introduce Julie Rico, our guest curator. Originally from Detroit, Michigan, Julie Rico moved to Los Angeles to exhibit work by artists left out of the mainstream. Her four art galleries and restaurant art gallery concept in downtown Los Angeles and Santa Monica have garnered critical acclaim over the years. Julie produced the first LA Art Fest in the Arts District, Los Angeles, wherein an indoor art exhibition was housed in a 55,000 square foot space, a five acre lot used for giant indoor sculptures, two main stages and one periphery stage where avant-garde music played, one stage with multicultural performers and an electronic music stage. Julie conceptualized and managed the mean art tent of the 1995 US Lollapalooza tour, curating a traveling exhibition of lowbrow and graffiti art to 30 cities. And Julia sat on the Bilingual Foundation of the Arts and the Laguna Art Museum boards. Julie Rico has a BA in journalism from Wayne State University in Detroit. And I'd like to add, you had an amazing, um, um, Julie Rico has an amazing gallery that, um, and this is where I fell, just fell for her practice. And she became goals when she had Julie Rico Gallery in Santa Monica. So um, introducing Julie Rico. Thank you, Charlene. I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, I wanted to thank you for you know, offering me this opportunity to do this talk today, uh, as well as all the work Valerium and Sarah has done and your assistant Roman. Uh, they've all been a great help to this exhibition, California Light, and to my writing on your website, Arcade Project Zine, uh, also Arcade Project Curatorial. And, uh, you know, I love you, thank you. Um, the exhibition California Light came about because of my life as a gallerist in Ocean Park, Santa Monica, California. And artists came to me with their ideas that reflected their political and physical environments. And when I was building the gallery in Santa Monica, it was in 1992. The Rodney King riots were happening at the exact same time. It was a very rough period in Los Angeles. Suddenly, all people of color had an existential problem of being feared by the white community. And I remember going in for breakfast down the street at the omelet parlor on Main Street, and most everybody in the restaurant stopped eating and talking to look at me as I opened the door, as if I had a gun and I was going to gun them all down. And I was just there for bacon and eggs. And I wanted to scream, hey, I was a brownie. I was a Girl Scout. I'm from Michigan. And it wouldn't have mattered. Their perception was sort of ingrained in their head. And this negative reaction really affected me. And I thought I would be accepted into Santa Monica as a gallery owner, but I never really was. Although I had my supporters and I thank them all, thank you. It really takes a critical mass of money clientele to support a gallery. And this is hard to achieve in LA when you look like me. Yet I persisted because I felt my gallery's perspective was critical to society. Now, flash forward to 2021, we're still dealing with the problem of social inequality based on false perceptions. Another big issue we all became aware of is the degradation of our environment due to fossil fuels and other pollutants. During these times, artists were creating in their studios and they were being affected by these influences we are all experiencing. Yet all of us in the creative community were still hanging on to the idea that there is beauty in this world. These are difficult concepts to unite and sometimes you can't. And often artists create their own emotions 
create from their own emotions. And sometimes I see an important subliminal message in their art. The artists that came to visit me and get in my gallery in Santa Monica came from all over the state and different parts of the city. And Los Angeles is unique in that there exists many different kinds of communities. It's one of the most polarized cities in America. Within these many communities, there are microclimates as well. That affects the light artists use in their art. Generally, it's very warm in the valley and East LA, it's hot and sunny. And near the ocean, it's cooler and the mist comes in in the morning to cover the area. This light affects the light we see in artists' work. Richard Diebenkorn is the artist that helped me understand light in art. Because I lived in Ocean Park, where Diebenkorn did his famous Ocean Park series, I could see in his art what he meant with his colors. My eye changed. I could see how the foggy mist affected his work. But then I also came to see how the artists from East LA use the light in their work, how the artists in the valley use the light in their work, how the desert artists use the light in their work, and even the artists I met from New York, how they use the light in their work. And I would encourage you to look up New York artists and just look at the difference between someone like Salvador Correa from East LA. Big difference in their light. Anyway, that's a long way around to discuss the artists that we're, we have here today. And I wanna welcome California artists, Rachel Bell and Nirali Thacker. And I just wanna introduce each one of them. Raquel Bell uh, is making art from the heart. She feels like the greed destroying life on earth has inspired her to get more in tune with nature and the divine aspects of life. And she hopes that the animals can bring their wisdom to the humans, human animals. And she portrays them in candid photographs and films. Bell's first animal film premiered in July, 2020 at the Taipei International Convention Center in Taiwan. Bell's new paintings invoke spiritual deities and include a death tribute painting to America's own sacrificial deity, the one and only George Floyd. Bell is painted, composed, performed in galleries, museums, and festivals internationally. Nirali, her expressions of her sexuality and social roles offer a riveting study of a woman's myriad prerogatives. She's an alumnus of Parsons School of Design, New York, MS, University of Baroda, and University of Southern California. Her art was recently exhibited at the Orange County Center for Contemporary Arts, Las Lagunas Gallery, Autry's Historic Museum, Mount Washington Campus, Avenue 50 Gallery, and Latino Museum of Art, among others. She has won the prestigious AFAX Award for her drawing and exhibited her art at the prestigious Treveni Art Gallery, MS University Gallery. Hussein Doshi Gufa, gallery in India. She is currently dividing her time between art practice and teaching art and art history as a faculty at North Orange County Community College, Ranso Santiago, Santiago Community College and Santa Ana College. Welcome to both of you. And I will have a, my first question. I'm always interested in how artists become artists and their early influences. So I'm gonna ask, um, I'm gonna ask Raquel first, how did you become an artist? And was there any one moment that distilled in your mind, okay, I'm gonna be an artist or was it a series of moments? Um, wow. Um, the, um, the first time I knew I was an artist was when I was walking down the street with a friend, I was wearing a suit and he said, don't you know you're an artist? <laughs> and I thought, well, that would explain a lot, <laughs> but it hadn't occurred to me that I was, um, that people from the outside might view me that way. Um, but I, I think I've always been an artist because of high creativity. I've 
always been painting or making or writing a song. Um, that's not a very exciting answer, but um, some people try really hard to access certain parts of themselves that are creative, but I don't. I have constant creative energy around me. My problem is the opposite, is making things that I can share and grounding my artistic sensibilities. Um, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed to be with all of you um, curators and artists right now. Uh, since COVID, you know, we've been so separate and um, it's, such, it's just an honor, really, Julie and, um, and everyone uh, to be part of this talk. Um, but perhaps Nirali will be more eloquent in answering this question. Perhaps not. <laughs> That was a good answer. <laughs> Perhaps not. I will. I actually. Uh, like. Uh, I'm going to piggyback onto what you said. Art, like me being an artist, is somebody like what somebody else perceived about me. Because for me, that was just a natural way of being. That I observe these things. I am more sensitive than others about certain things. So I just assume that's how everybody is, you know? So, and this happened even like for me, it happened like very early with my, when my mother and my, how my mother observed me. So I even say sometimes like I began serious art at the age of four and I mean it. And because I was rebellious about it, like my dad used to work in computers. So I wrote and those days they used to have those cards on which they would do their work. I drew all over those and I got in trouble because of that. So at some point they had to be like, okay, just give her a drawing book so she will be out of her way. But in general, I would say art is, uh, being an artist is just something who you are in your everyday things that you do. And art informs not only with what you draw or paint, that's just a by, like that's just a final product of it. Art comes in how you eat, how you write, how you perceive the world, how you talk, how you perceive other, human beings, it permeates to everything you do. And I think artists per se view the world in a different way that, that makes the, an, an artist from the very get go, the point at which you start drawing or other people are, uh, are realize it like, wow, that has some skill or you know some aesthetics per se, that is like a secondary product. And I another thing myth I wanted to also like, I don't know if it's a myth or not, but in like when I was younger or till I was graduating from art school and all that, I was like, okay, these are artists who exhibit in galleries. This is one category. But as a teacher, when I'm teaching, uh, when I'm teaching, no matter who comes to my room, you know, I have students who have Alzheimer's, I have students who have dementia, who have never drawn before. I now believe I want to get out the artist from everybody. I want to. I want to recognize the artist in everybody because all of us have an artist in us. Some may be more gallery worthy than others. Maybe you may, you may if you may want to call that, but I think all of us have an artist within us. Each of us is very creative and extraordinary in our own way, in whatever realm you may be working in. You know? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, Narali. I, I, am a, I teach at the Getty. Sometimes I'm a docent there and you know I get it the kids and I just see uh, sort of a dearth of education in the arts and how that's just squishing their minds to not be creative. And you need creativity in everything you do, no matter if you're an artist or not. Exactly. So it's just so critical uh, that whole, you know, let's create, let's be creative uh, mindset. So yeah, totally agree. And just that some of us end up being more creative than others and we actually go into the creative fields. Uh, and maybe that makes us a little bit crazier because <laughs> it is difficult. It, it is a difficult world to enter. I'm gonna go into my next question. Um, what do you think the value of the artist is in today's society? So Raquel, again, I'm gonna go back to you. What do you think about your value as an artist? Such a heavy question for me. Um, I've, I've certainly felt like an outsider, if that makes sense. Um, 
I am particularly interested in art that has meaning. And a lot of art is abstract and it's beautiful. And I, lo I love that too. But what I'm talking about is art that comes from a culture that teaches you how to be a person. And I am very interested in the medicine wheel and art around different uh, native cultures from around the world. When I lived in New York City, I lived there for almost 12 years. And one of my favorite places to go was the Rubin Museum. And they had ancient Jane art. And I was so inspired and moved by the art because it illuminated ways in which to be a human. For instance, there was a giant wooden sculpture head uh, with a big mouth. And once a year, they would spill beer and alcohol out of the mouth and everybody would get drunk and really go crazy. But they didn't do that every day. They did it during these festivals because humans need to get the lead out. That's part of war and anger and sports metal music, whatever it is, it's important. And they understood that. So they made special times for people to do that in a way that, you know, worked. And uh, my heart feels like there's an emptiness in the United States. Artists are, like, for instance, I was on tour once with my um, punk band from New York and we were going through the Midwest and I was walking through a grocery store parking lot alone and a woman walked up to me and said, you're disgusting. I will never forget it, obviously, but I was just me and she perceived me as a threat of some kind. She judged me in that way. And I think that illuminates the role of the artist <laughs> that perhaps we don't have a role or not enough of a role. And if we do, it's not reaching across the country, and we have a big country, understand it. LA is different from New, from New York as is every state, but um, that's what I have to say about that. I wish there was more uh, art that brought people into the human experience in a way that helped us understand what it means to be a human being. I love that you're a punk. <laughs> um, so what, you, I have to know what your punk band's name was. Oh, it's an amazing band. Um, we are not broken up, but we haven't played in a few years. We're called Normal Love. Normal Love. Oh, okay. Well, that's an unusual name for <laughs> Normal Love. I love I have it. to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's cool. Nirali, same question. Do you have a... Can you repeat the question? I was so lost in her answer. Yeah, I know. That was a great answer. So do you... Um, what do you think the value of the artist is in today's society? Or do you feel valued even as an artist today? You know, I know you're a teacher and you're a professor, but um, you know, what, what do you see the value is that people perceive that artists take on? Um, being valued, if I were to talk about in a material way, like how my art, like the, the thing is, that's the, that's the little misconception or, or, the, or the, maybe the actual conception which I'm refusing to see, which is like how much dollar value is associated with your work of art. In that case, my mind straight, my whole, whole uh, even with my students, I keep telling them my, my, what, my goal is, my goal is to be as passionate as, a, passionate as Van Gogh never sold any artwork in his life and his entire life self-taught how he struggled, how he dedicated every ounce of money he had or every ounce of life he had in him to his art, painted voraciously. So, and then that time he was, he died penniless. And then of course, later on, we value his work at, in millions of dollars. So in terms of financial value, how do you know what is the value of your art unless you create it? Uh, that is the financial aspect of it. Otherwise, I, uh, I mean, I like what Raquel said, like, because the role of artist, like, as I was saying before, as me as an art educator, my role is to see beauty in ordinary things, in the ugly things, in the, to see the extraordinary in the ordinary. And this also as an educator, you are teaching people how to see 
see the world. Like the incident that happened with Rakhia, we all have had that in different versions. Even if somebody didn't walk us, walk to us and tell us that you're ugly or not, we've had that. That's because people, people are not seeing the world in that open-minded way. Artist, art and art education brings that open-mindedness to people. That's the true value of art. And like right now we are stuck in pandemic. Where would we be if we did not have art? We wouldn't have music. We wouldn't have art. We wouldn't have TV. I mean, it's a, it's a trickle down of art only, right? TV or films are an amalgamation of various kinds of art. We would, we would be very bored and very dry if we did not have art in our life. Yeah. Um, and very sad, very sad. Yeah. Our day-to-day -day things would bring us down. Like I teach art to Alzheimer's patients. So at sometimes when I walked in the first time to their uh, hospital, like I was like, I was appointed by North Orange County Community College to teach there. I was like, why am I even here? It's even like first day I felt like it's even a pretense to even think that I'm going to teach them something. Like what, who am I kidding? But <laughs> as I sat there, like as I, but then I, it occurred to me that this is where I might make the most difference. People are in their wheelchairs. People are non-verbal. People are throwing things. The staff is afraid of them. That's how the students are. But when they engage themselves with art, when they engage themselves with art, they are happy. They see themselves as somebody who is big, somebody who's capable of creating something. And that gives them that joy and that ambition. It's just, it just makes you see yourself in a different way, which is so important. Just to create, a, and we're not even talking about the actual output or product, what they painted. And let me just take a little bit smaller time on this. Like my mom, um, she, she died of cancer, but when she was uh, sick with cancer, I remember she was, uh, like I was learning art at another uh, facility. I was learning clay modeling and all that. So I was 16 at that time. So I brought some clay for my mother because, you know, it will be some physical therapy for my mother. Like she liked the exercise. She liked it. Like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm making this sculpture. And then she was also excited. Oh, bring me some. And then I brought some clay for her. My mother started making some small, small things with the clay at that time. And her hands were very weak with all the chemotherapy. And she was like, nearly almost on deathbed at that point oh uh, but when she started making those things I was 16 and I was like oh she doesn't know how to draw or like what because she made very small things you know she made very small things and I, I was a little bit disappointed like she she's not really doing anything but I now that I recollect reflect back on that time at that time my mother felt so happy so empowered by the fact that she could engage in the art process she had started dragging herself to the kitchen she had started cooking she had started acting like a normal mother so that experience of just having her do the art for just maybe those one week made me have my mother back as she really was for whatever that one month was until so that's the value of art I I could not agree with you more. I, I remember when the gal when I had my gallery, people used to come, artists used to come to my gallery with their stuff, you know, mounds of drawings and stuff. And they'd be like, why am I doing this? And I'd say, you're an artist. And they didn't even know what that meant. And even when I started, I didn't know, really know what that meant. Um, and what happens is if you don't know what that means, and you're never given an opportunity to open a path for yourself to be creative. And there aren't others on that path with you supporting you. You can go off the path and go crazy. I mean, really, literally, something bad can happen. And I, that just happened recently to somebody that I knew that I know was an artist, but never was told that he was an artist, never realized why he was different. And, you know, that was... That's why I love my gallery so much, because I was there to help people realize their path. Wow. And, you know, it was more important than even the art, the art, the art collectors, although I needed the collectors to support the gallery. Uh, 
it was more important that we met artists that we could say, yeah, you're an artist and you should be revered as a special person in this world. Um, one of the things I do want to mention is that, you know, the biggest export in the United States is intellectual property. Um, that's the most valuable export we have, and that's books and songs and art. So it is extremely valuable. Although we don't often feel it in our day-to-day -day lives as people that support the arts and a lot of artists that I meet, um, you know, it's just, it's just, it's undervalued on so many levels. But yeah, thank you, Norelli, for that. So now we're going to go into the philosophy of your art. Um, and Raquel, I know you have your own world and philosophy thoughts on your art. And I really am dying to hear that. And also Narali, you have a big broad, you know, perspective on your art in terms of philosophy. So I'm gonna ask Raquel first, uh, what your philosophy is behind your art. My art philosophy developed on accident, but it was extremely powerful. I had learned to meditate out of necessity I was depressive when I was in my 20s and I was searching for anything to help. So I began meditating and I remember sitting down at my table and I started drawing in a meditative state. And the art came out from another universe. It wasn't for my mind or an idea. And it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever made. It had life in it. And that experience changed the way I played music, I communicated, and I, I, I learned that it was a treasure. And so I kept doing it. I made it a practice to sit there, become a part of a meditative vibration and make time to channel these drawings. They really started out as drawings. And eventually um, that was able to translate to other mediums because I'd learned through the drawing. And the philosophy, to me, it became very spiritual in nature. I wasn't getting this connection to a greater something from any other part of my life. It was art that was bringing me closer to this kind of mysterious realm. And that is when my art really started to have a momentum and I began showing it um, and making it more a part of my life. And then eventually um, my philosophy, well, I, I wanna talk about the current show, but I have a feeling you might ask questions about that. No, I, no, I really want, I was just gonna say, we have Jack Rabbit Desert up right now. Okay, so I will talk about yeah, it. Yeah, could you, because, so, you know, we all fell in love with your rabbit photographs. We're just like, we want one of these. They're so good. Yeah. Uh, and Charlene so, freaked out over it. Right. Um, so it's a good talk about these. Okay. Um, so I, I, I thought of myself more as a painter and then all of, and a musician, but all of a sudden, COVID happened. And I wasn't living in LA at the time. We were renting a house in the desert in California. And I became a photographer. It was only because of COVID. It was only because of quarantine. But because I was here every single day at this house, I started making friends with the animals. And this is my spiritual philosophy in action I was meditating outside and I would open my eyes and there'd be a bird sitting next to me and a lizard on my leg and a rabbit drinking water. And every day I was meeting more and more animals. <laughs> and I couldn't believe this is what my life had turned into. So I bought some cameras and they let me photograph them. It became a real relationship with the land the fires were happening, um, smoke was in the air, and there was more and more animals that looked thirsty and ragged, so I would leave water out. I would put food out for the animals, and in turn, they would let me photograph them in right next to the house. So I was able to share these 
beautiful beings that were making my life extraordinary and start working on these photographs. Uh, I had my first show of photographs at the La Matadora Gallery in Joshua Tree and people loved it. Even though it was COVID, not many people could come in the gallery once, you know, a few people with a mask and it just felt like, it felt like destiny. And I am continuing to photograph the animals now and make movies with them. And you were talking about the light. And that really struck me because I have a night vision camera. So I can go out at night, I'm a night owl anyway, stay out all night or move the camera around, find the spots where the animals like to come. And um, in the darkness, there's just a whole nother world that happens. Oh, yeah. in. And that's kind of what artists do is they bring to light the things or into the dark, the things that you wouldn't see normally. So I am so excited to have these photographs just so people can at least see how beautiful the animals are while we have them and hopefully we will protect them. Yeah. Thank you, Raquel. I really, I really get that desert light in your pieces. Uh, and uh, I really want to see way more pieces from you about this. I would love to have come to that show. Uh, but yeah, please keep us informed about what you're doing. And you know, I have many more pieces. <laughs> okay, yeah, we want to see them. <laughs> so, Nirali, uh, tell us a little bit about your work. We have this piece. This piece, just amazing piece with the red uh, quilt blanket over the woman. Uh, and then somebody screaming there in the background. Please tell us what you were thinking when you were right, making this piece. Oh, God. Oh God! <laughs> this this piece is actually about female masturbation. Um, I wanted to because I see a lot of like in Los Angeles. I see a lot of people who like you know we have beautiful life here, uh, but there's a lot of loneliness. There's a lot of loneliness. Women are beautiful. Women do a lot to make their life on track and everything do everything correctly. And still there's a lot of loneliness. And when like somebody had remarked about some, some made some remark about masturbation in a, in a degrading way, but then I wanted to examine what is the concept, like what is masturbation and why masturbation? And why are, have we created so much loneliness in our society? We all are looking for connections and yet we have created this lonely world. And what comes up during masturbation? What happens really during masturbation? So I was, trying to see what images are coming up. And then I actually, the screaming lady, uh, interestingly, that is Anna Chong. Uh, she was actually a USC graduate. I saw a documentary on, on her life in Sundance and she had decided that she's gonna have 500 encounters in the same, so she's gonna sleep with five, like, you know, have an intercourse with 500 people in the same uh, session. That's, wow. That was her thing. So, and I could not believe it either. So I had to check out the documentary. So I checked out the documentary and it was, it, it blew my mind because uh, even just, and she was like a normal politics student, politics major student at USC. I went to USC. And so for me, like I had to pay an homage to her and she also got exploited in that whole process. She did what she, she had, and she did what she enjoyed. She claimed that she enjoyed it. She did what she wanted to do. And other people obviously profited about out of her more. So I have some images of Anna Chong from that documentary in there. And then some, and then also at the same time, you know, how your life traverses as you get older, like how you see sex when you're 25, when you're 16, how you, uh, see it as I'm not going to tell you my age now. <laughs> um, so how that view of sex changes. So I remember making a painting of two lions mating when I was 25. And that was a very powerful painting. So I had to pay homage to that lioness having uh, lioness mating. So I just see a lion in that image. And also somewhere even the father images come up or even uh, sexual predator images come up. So I was just wanted to also examine what images are coming to me. And art inherently becomes therapeutic. It just becomes that. I did not intend to do art as a therapy in my own life, but 
I have seen that once I have something that is bothering me, like anything could be bothering me, but once I start painting or drawing it, more and more layers of that somehow unravel and things just become peaceful. So I, I want to talk about the other one too. Uh, the, Can you go to the next piece, uh, Valeria? Yeah. Was that too much? Sorry. No, that was amazing. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm really glad you're talking about that piece because I did not know about that artist, Wong. Uh, I just wrote something about my sister's sort of similar story about a lot of men, just beauty and men. And, you know, when you're beautiful, how many men are attracted to you? It's like this never ending stream of men. And, you know, what do you do with that? And, you know, it sounds like the artist Wong tried to take it into her own hands and sort of gain control over that. Uh, I'm not sure she did, but uh, yeah, it's an interesting story for sure. Yeah, I'll share with you more about that documentary later on because, uh, yeah, it's just like, wow, what courage. Uh, yeah. Uh, but let me talk about this yeah. one. Uh, yeah. This one is called The Wall. Uh, this one was inspired by my the house in my childhood. Uh, like when I come to America, it's again, I, I'm, I really, I'm really moved by what you said about the light and how it changes for different artists. I'm really still registering that. But yeah, when I was in uh, America, I see the walls like very perfect, like, very pristine, very like flat. And uh, it's somehow like, for me, even now I'm not used to it, it's been 20 years. But when I see walls in India, especially the wall where I, like this was the wall from my childhood house and from my terrace. And this is the wall which my, like we didn't have access to internet at that time or anything or even a good art library or artwork. Like I didn't know all these artists when I was growing up, but my mother would show me all these forms in that wall, you know? And the walls itself had a character because people didn't have the money to actually do the right kind of repair. So you would do the, it's like a lot of banded things are happening. You would paint it and then you would put plaster in one place and the other place is now bumpy. And then the structure is showing and the rod is showing. Then you put another layer of, so a lot of that. But in the process, the wall actually got stronger and stronger and the wall did stand the test of time and it shows all these injuries it had and all these healing people did or so the wall itself has this character so i wanted to represent that wall and all the and for me i'm also paying homage to that wall because there were not even that many clouds we look more times at the wall you know we look more times at the sea water in the wall and i imagine all the forms coming up and that's what these are like my sort of artist exercises that my mother taught me when I was very young. So yeah, that's, so I wanted to pay homage to that wall. So I created that painting and that's my image from my child, like the terrace of my house. Oh. That's so cool. I, I love actually seeing photographs of walls, like old walls that have lots of different colors because of repairs and things like that. So I totally get this piece now. I totally understand it. And also, this is the light that you remember from you, where you lived. Like, it's sort of like your memory of the light. Like, so cool. Yeah, very good. Let's go to her next piece, uh, which this is the piece that I really want to talk about, which really got me turned on to you as soon as I saw this piece, because I just thought, this woman is awesome. <laughs> and like, you know, this is kind of like, this you know thing we're always doing when we're here in America, and we don't we're not the inheritors of what you know people that came before us inherited. We are always trying to figure it out. We have to figure it out every step of the way. So tell me a little bit about your thoughts behind this piece. Um. I love it. I love this one for many reasons. A, I used to get lost. I get lost everywhere in India, in America. I get lost everywhere. So, and I had this GPS, which would go recalculating. The older GPS, in like 10 years ago, it would go. And whenever you got lost, it goes recalculating, recalculating. <laughs> so, and then I was like, why doesn't somebody, like, I wanted a GPS in my life, which would recalculate and tell me which way I'm supposed to go. So, uh, and then being in America, also like many times I'm traveling, I'm like 
where am I? Like, am I in Ladakh? Am I in California? Where am I? Like, I would really zone out, <laughs> uh, which is why I get lost. Uh, I go into <laughs> this meditative state in my, when I'm driving and then I'm lost, like physically and mentally. Uh, so that it, the own image started from there. And then I used to wear uh, this scarf because I used to get a headache. So I used to get, wear this scarf all the time, which was black. And everybody would ask me like, hey, are you from Pakistan? Are you from Middle East? And I was like, first of all, it's a compliment because those women are beautiful. So I was like, thank you. Uh, but at the same time, I was feeling insulted for them because they are really pretty. And then also they tuck their scarf in a very specific, very controlled, modest way. You know, Their scarf is about modesty and they pin it in a very specific way. So I also felt a little bit angered or irritated by this how can you just not know what a Muslim woman represents or is and confuse her for somebody else? So I was like, are you not seeing like what is like, you know, what is the difference between India and a woman from Middle East? So that kind of generalization of all the races that are brown, that bothered me. So I put that scarf on me to do that. And then also in America, when I come, uh, and that you're not like, you know, how is beauty seen in America? It's like that blonde woman and that, you know, and that you, they want the blonde with the whatever, five, seven height or whatever, which is the normal for them. And uh, women of minorities kind of get excluded out of that, you know, just because of your shape, size, whatever, you just get excluded and excluded and you're not seen. And you might say that you're seen because of your work, but let's face it, being like women's sexuality is a huge part of who they are, how they present themselves, how they feel about themselves. And it is seen as a power when you are looked, if you're seen in a certain desirable way, that does give you a trump card over things. So I wanted to, and I'd also get confused, should I present myself like this? Or should I present like myself like this? I get confused as a middle-aged woman I get confused what should I press which foot shall I put forward so that's why I have this tiny red strap of a bra showing there it's like, it's like my assertion of my sensuality there that's so cool I love that this is just one of my favorite pieces for sure right it's an extraordinary uh thoughts behind it and uh you know the energy and everything about it thank you so much thank you. um yeah, thank you, you guys. We're gonna we're getting close to the end now, so I kind of just want to go through a few more slides uh, of some of the other artists in the exhibition, and then I also really want to get some questions from our audience. Uh, so uh, let me just go through these slides very quickly. This is the artist Benzula, who's a local LA artist. Uh, he's an amazing musician. Um, I just love the way he interpreted the light in this piece uh, with the yellow there by the flower uh, and all the yellow sort of like reflecting an image of the sun. And to me, uh, the sort of red character on the side on the right is really him because he is this ball of energy. He's like this red hot energy of creative thoughts and and and. and and energy that he puts out. So I just I just love this piece by Menzula. And then the next piece, this is uh, Salvador Correa and he's from East LA. And this is a good example of light in East LA. So um, also you can see what the houses are like there. There's always, there's hills over there. It's just the, you know, he's made this very uh, idyllic image of, of his neighborhood and, uh, and, you know, the sort of uh, modest uh, cars there uh, sort of idealized. So very beautiful. And in the next one, um, so this is actually on the west side. <laughs> and this is like his, I'd rather be here picture. <laughs> And I thought this was interesting too, because this is, you know, it's cooler on the west side, more upscale cars, the house looks a little more upscale. So it's sort of like when you're on the east side, you kind of always want to be on the west side if you can get there. So I understand this picture quite a lot. <laughs> 
And then we also have Ben Hellenhoff, who did these pieces in the desert, uh, these installations, which I think are striking. Uh, and he can put an installation in your yard. <laughs> He's available. So just love these pieces by him. I think there's one more picture of his piece. Oh, this is this is by Barbara Frone. Now she is in Malibu. And you can see that sort of cool air with the gray clouds, the mistiness of the ocean. Uh, and she really reflects that in this piece. And I really love, I love the ocean. I love being by the ocean here in California. And I, I just love this sort of gray blue piece that she did, light of an ordinary day, she says. Very good. And thank you very, very much for joining me today, Nirali and Raquel, and thanks to Charlene Stevens and Valeria for hosting us. Uh, it was an awesome talk and hopefully we can get a few questions from the audience. If you could just maybe um, write in the maybe chat section. And also you can raise your hand um, if you see the place to raise your hand on the video. Um, and um, Raquel, <laughs> I guess I'll start with a question you know, <laughs> with um, the, the photography. Yeah, I thought it was amazing. I think when, I, when they first came in, I was asking Julie, is she only printing them that small? Because they're, I mean, you definitely should print larger. Um, they're amazing I'm images. Working on it, Charlene. <laughs> okay, I'm because, working on it. <laughs> and I want one because <laughs> um, yeah, it just really struck me when all the, all the work came in. Um, and and you had a very interesting interpretation of light, and um, you know, and with photography, you're using light as a medium, but also looking into like night vision and. Um, so, but you said you were, you started as a painter? Yes, I am a painter. Um, I currently have a painting, uh, in an opening tomorrow. Uh, it's, it's pretty large. Uh, I was saying earlier how I would do these meditative drawings. Uh, they became paintings eventually as I kept pursuing it over the years and mostly watercolor, although I'll do mixed media. I'll use acrylic sometimes uh, or oil. And of these, of these two works, I mean, is this part of a larger, are you making a larger series? Because I would love to see, you know, uh, you yes. know I really think that a standalone photography, you know, exhibition is in your future. Yes, um, I'm working with my friend in New York, David Marshall, who's a great curator um, and photographer. And we're trying to get them as big as we can get them and still have the magic. Um, come through. So we've been doing test prints and trying to, you know, make the perfect show for the animals and video. So there's also going to be animal films and I do manipulate the video. Um, so I, I'm interested in dance. Um, I've danced a lot in my life and the animals move in ways you cannot even imagine. They'll be in one position and then another position. And how did they get there? So I can slow down the film and I can see how, you know, a rabbit or a jackrabbit can like extend and I can reveal that. It's like seeing a secret into a whole nother universe. Because so you, I mean, I'm, I'm almost hearing something like, um, like Edward Moybridge, you know, in the, um, the motion studies with the horse and stuff. It's totally, it's totally <laughs> like that. It's definitely like that. I, I am trying to keep up with the incredible work I've been getting from them, if that makes I, sense. I think it's um, definitely do the deep dive. And um, and yeah, with the motion studies, like you're even really dipping into, you know, really going into the history of photography. I mean, it's like a whole, there's a lot of places you go with that. And I'm really looking forward to seeing more. And Thank then I have so a much. question, like in Nirali, I think when we talked before this, um, you know, we were saying, you know, do I give the easy answer or the real answer? But I really like, you know, the real explanation. And I thought a lot of what you're talking about was the gaze and how men see women. But I really like the piece where you're prioritizing, 
female pleasure. And it's really how women see our, how we see ourselves and we, how we see our own pleasure, which is rarely prioritized even with us. Yeah. So, um, and so I just took a question about the gaze, like a brown gaze, a female gaze, you know, what, um, what are your thoughts on, you know, just turning that gaze around, you know, and prioritizing yours, you know, your gaze, your pleasure, your, you know, and centering yourself in a world, well, in a society or in a country that's not centering you. Wow. First of all, <laughs> this question <laughs> needs to be framed for itself. <laughs> and just like, I'm not even going to rush in to answer this. Like everybody just frame this question and keep looking into the answer in yourself because this is such an important question that you have put. Charlene, thank you. Okay, so the question itself is the highlight of this as far as I'm concerned <laughs> because... <laughs> Because we, we don't think about this. Oh, sorry, one second. Because oh, it's such a, I'm, I'm actually in discovery still. What do I really want? What, what represents my, what, what is sensuous for me? What is pleasure for me? What am I doing for other people? What am I doing for myself? I'm constantly like trying to examine that all the time like what like yesterday was my birthday how was I dressed for my own birthday I was like birthday. whatever <laughs> and today this interview is there so I'm like oh let me look all like you know like this but but that's not for like a male gaze thing but yeah I like how much that's very interesting question I'm going to not even going to answer it I'm going to think about it we can okay well that. I would love to discuss it further because I yes. think it was like a whole can of worms. I think I opened at the end of this talk yes. but uh, we definitely need to revisit this when we really have time to dive in Yes, yes, yes. No, but yeah, it's very important how women really see like what is really important, not even getting a man or a, a, a man or even say approval from anybody at, as being the end product. How do we see ourselves? What really gives us joy? That is like very profound. That needs to be meditated on. <laughs> and yeah, and actually just a woman or an, an or a not or someone who isn't white, like actually centering their gaze, their pleasure, themselves, their joy, is a radical act these days. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. like very painful for me. It's actually too painful a place for me to go there even because, like, when I come from India, I'm seen as a beautiful woman there. When I come here, like, even from the airport, I can see I'm invisible. You know. It, 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 like when I, I came here when I was 25, I suddenly you're invisible. And that, sh that is very shocking. Like it might sound very shallow to somebody, like how you are treated as a beautiful woman versus how you are seen now as like, you know, now I'm older also, but how you are seen as a, suddenly you are like not it, you know? Like the whole attention goes on the uh, blonde women or the, or whatever is perceived as attractive in this culture, in this, uh, and even in India, actually, it's, we're not that non-racist ourselves. Even there, they, they, we have a lot of shadeism, let's put it that way. Not, if not racism, we are the same race. But if a sister, if we are two sisters, one sister is like fairer complexion than the other. She's more preferred even by her own parents and her grandparents. How we does have she the same issue um, with, um, uh, with the Black community in the United States. Um, colorism is um, rampant, runs rampant where... Um, we've internalized the racism and then cast it upon us and, and then focus and then focus it on others. Like our and, own, and, and it own even, own it, it also, sorry, I'm uh, over, but I'm just, you know, it also uh, ruins the relationships between women like that. Because if one is perceived as more prettier and the, for, because of no, nothing they, they themselves did or achieved or worked hard on, you know? One is, if any one person is perceived as more desirable through no none of their own merit and the other one is just not, you know? The true racism, I think, is begin when you just decide that I'm not gonna like this person and I'm gonna like this person for whatever reasons. You're already beginning something like, a, I love this person just a little less. And I think that is a problem. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's the same thing in the Mexican American community. My sister had very light skin and she was like yeah. a goddess in our family. 
and uh, it's a uh, it's the same thing everywhere, I think. But yeah, the other the other thing that comes with that is that my sister gets this perception. So all of the things that she really is, what she was good at writing, she was good at poetry, she was good at, a, at singing. I mean, she's good at a bunch of things. It's almost doesn't matter because she's this sort of goddess-like looking creature. And so all of her attributes got overlooked, her real core attributes. And, and that happens to a lot of women where the beauty supersedes your brain or any accomplishments you may have made. It's like not even seen, none of those are even thought about or seen. And they wanna look at this other thing or, or, or you know, compare you to just how beautiful you are. And that's the why you got this or why you're doing that. And that's, that's just wrong. Yeah, and I also like thank you for saying that. And, and even as like and, and as I'm getting older, I'm like, what is my role in the society? Me as a community member who is giving more to the community, that is more important than me trying to look however. And all these things, the funny part is all these things take time. If I want to get a size zero figure with me, I will have to give four hours over there in my day. You know, or should I spend my time there or should I spend my time in my creativity? Should I spend my time in community service? This is all time consuming. It, it, so how much time you dedicate where? And we as women have so much to give, so much to give to the society. We need to be focusing on that rather than, you know, which low carb diet I mean, makes me yeah. more cranky. <laughs> But also just all of the emotional labor that we put out, you know, we also do need to practice self-care. And I think right. that's the radical act of we're always giving, but we're never taking care of, but we're rarely taking care of ourselves. Um, I have something from Sid Carter, just wanted to say, you know, I don't have a question, but Raquel and Neurali's work felt nostalgic to me. And Neurali's comments on the wall were, were nostalgic. And does anyone, are there any more questions as we're gonna end because um, for the IGTV, it's only, we only have, um, they only had to take an hour of the recording. Um, so um, are there any other questions before we um, wrap this up? Um, okay, well, I would like to thank Julie Rico. You're amazing. You, as I said, I have, you know, you were an inspiration to my entire career. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, you know, I just, I'm so happy to have ha to ha have this opportunity to be working with you. I mean, I'm just, it's amazing. I never thought in the nineties that, you know, we would be in the, right here. And um, Nirali Thacker, thank you. And Raquel Bell, thank you. I love your work and I'm really happy that you joined us. Valeria. You are amazing. Thank you very much for um, helping facilitate this talk and putting everything together. Thank you everyone for joining, especially the Malibu cousins. I see you <laughs> and I really appreciate you all being here. And uh, we are gonna, we're gonna, and please look out for um, more talks. And um, we are definitely gonna take a deeper dive into all of this art. And um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for having us.